So we have looked at the ignoble quest, uh, and now we're going to look at the noble quest. And what is the noble quest? It is when someone who is themselves liable to be reborn uh, understands the drawbacks in being liable to be reborn, uh, seeks to free them from... Uh-oh. I just had to edit a little bit. <laughs> freedom from rebirth, not 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 rebikrit, whatever it is, rebirth, the supreme sanctuary from the yoke, extinguishment. Yeah, this is the noble quest. So the the point here, and this is kind of the really the important point. First of all, you have to understand that you are liable to be reborn. Yeah. And uh, this is not always an easy thing to understand. In the beginning, it comes from a degree of faith and confidence in the word of the Buddha. That's where it starts from. Uh, and uh, that's kind of where it begins. Uh, but uh, that is not really enough. Uh, so even if you think, yeah, even if you have a degree of faith that you're going to be reborn, uh, you have to understand what that actually means. Uh, yeah, What does it mean to be reborn? Uh, what is kind of the... Uh, uh, what what are the consequences of that? Uh, um, what you know, in, in other words, often we talk about Buddhism about the idea of right view. Uh, right view is that there is such a thing as rebirth, that the rebirth process is driven by karma and these kind of things. Uh, but uh, that in itself, just that knowledge and understanding of what rebirth is, and that there may be such a thing, maybe you even accept it, is not really enough. Uh, that is a very superficial kind of right view. Uh, but if you understand what that means as a felt experience, what does it feel like to be reborn? What does it feel like that this sequence kind of carries on into the future? Yeah, Understanding the danger in these things, the fact that you're going to do these things again and again and again, the fact that it is really a lot of suffering to have to go through the same problems, the same issues, life after life after life, that is a really big problem. So this is, you have to understand what the samsaric existence is all about. And if you don't, and without that understanding, this thing doesn't really come together here. So you have, to, you have to actually reflect on the idea of rebirth, what it means. Then you start to understand the drawbacks. And if all of these beings that you are with, they have to go through the sequence of rebirths, you have to go through it. Do you want to really tie yourself down to other beings who have the same problem? If you can extract yourself from that problem, well, maybe you can help them in the future as well. Otherwise, we're just kind of compounding the issue that is already there. Yes, yeah, so you have to really reflect uh, on these things. And the idea of rebirth, we'll come back to this later on, uh, especially when we talk about the uh, five senses and the, and the five sense world. And the more you understand the uh, five sense world, uh, you also understand the idea, the problem of rebirth uh, that comes from that five sense world. Uh, yeah, Because these things are very closely related to each other. Uh. So, um, only when you understand the drawback in these things uh, is it possible to seek the freedom from these things. Yeah, you seek the freedom. So, this I've completely messed this up, I haven't really changed the, the thing here. So, it actually should be it seeks the freedom from rebirth. Uh, yeah, because you understand that it is a problem. The, um, uh, but the Sujatu, I think, has the unborn there, but I think the unborn is a kind of unfortunate translation because it uh, kind of gives the idea that uh, you're looking for some kind of state. But actually, if rebirth is a problem, then what you're seeking for is, of course, an end to the problem. So you're seeking for the freedom from that rebirth. Uh, and then you have the idea of the supreme sanctuary from the yoga. This is the uh, Anuttara Yoga Kema. And uh, so this is like a, a sanctuary from exertion. Yeah, you don't have to exert yourself anymore. You can relax uh, because you come to an end of these things. Uh, and then extinguishment, which is Nibbana, which is, is the same thing. Yeah. But this is quite a difficult contemplation to do because you may not know that there is rebirth and you may find it hard. Uh, but uh, the, the um, contemplations that come after this are much more interesting because they are much more hands-on. Uh, these are things that you can relate to straight away as a consequence. So, so yeah, the next one is about growing old. It is when someone who is themselves liable to grow old, understanding the drawbacks in being liable to grow old, seek the freedom from old age, 
the supreme sanctuary from the yoke or from exertion, extinguishment, nibbana. And this is where it gets interesting because these are things that is very easy to relate to. Uh, yeah? You can know what is going on here. Uh. And uh, this is uh, a contemplation that the Buddha talks about in many, many different places in the suttas. <clears throat> there is a, this is talked about in the, a sutta called the Five Themes. I can't remember now what the Pali word is for that particular sutta. And Gutra 5 is 57, I think it is. And it talks about five contemplations that everyone should do. <coughs> and everyone means, in this context, it means whether you are a monastic or a layperson, whether you are a woman or a man, these are the kind of contemplations you should do. So, uh, so this is kind of um, central yeah, to the whole Buddhist path. These are some of these perceptions. We're talking about developing perceptions and developing the perceptions of growing old and having that in mind is actually kind of core to what these teachings are about. And so don't kind of uh, go past these very simple ideas, uh, very easy to relate to because they are so close to our heart because we know exactly what these things mean. Yeah, we don't kind of uh, overlook these things because they, they look kind of obvious. And the, again, the way that you know that you haven't really understood these things properly uh, is very similar to the th other things we talked about before regarding impermanence. Uh, if you look at yourself in the mirror and you see, oh no, I'm growing old, uh, and you don't like what you see, yeah, then that means you haven't really taken it on board. Yeah? And this is probably very common. It's very difficult not to have a reaction. You see yourself, you see kind of your hair is getting grayer, the limbs are getting kind of weaker, you can't see as well as you used to do, you can't hear as well, all of these kind of things. And what that means is that uh, um, old age, is, you know, it's there in front of you, it's kind of bleeding obvious. And so then you have a reaction to that. And very often the reaction that you have to kind of growing old is you don't really want to see it. Yeah, you kind of deny a denial of these things. And so instead of being in denial, what you do when you see yourself in this way, you see these things happen, you take it on board. Instead of that immediate reaction which rejects what is going on, you take a second, you are patient with it, you feel, what does it feel like? Okay, this is the reality. There's no point in trying to deny the reality. If I deny the reality, I'm actually just not using the opportunity for spiritual growth. That is kind of really bad. Just stay with it for a while. See what happens when you stay with this kind of view of yourself as an older person, where things are kind of falling apart. Yeah, things are going downhill. You're going only in one direction, really. What does that feel like? Yeah, and that feeling that arises when, that hap when you do that, when you kind of take it on board, that this body really is heading in the kind of direction, going kind of getting worse and worse and worse until eventually you die, that feeling is eventually a sense of giving up interest in the five sense world. Yeah? There's a slight giving up of that interest uh, because you're no longer attaching to the body as well as much as you did before because you realize the body is actually problematic. Uh, yeah, it does have all of these downsides. Old age is one of these downsides. So when you stay with it, it has a very beautiful consequence. The consequence is that you become more peaceful. Yeah, because when you detach, when you let go of some of that holding on to the, to the body, the moment you let go of that, the moment you kind of see the reality, that letting go means you become more peaceful. And so this is the beautiful thing about this very simple contemplation like this. If you do it right, if you stay with it, yes, I'm getting older. Why am I holding on to this body? Why? What, what is the interest in this body anyway? Something which is kind of inherently, is it, is it, it's treacherous, this body. Yeah? It's, it's treason. It's kind of, uh, it's not really living up to what I would like it to be. This robber is like a... Uh, it's not kind of uh, not, not doing what it's supposed to do according to our attachments and what we want it to do. And so when you take that on board, uh, you let go a little bit. Uh, the five sense world becomes less interesting. Uh, at that moment, you become more peaceful. Uh, and this is the beauty of these kind of reflections. Uh, they have that ability to uh, uh, guide your mind onto spiritual qualities. Uh, yeah? Less interest in the five sense world, more interest in the spiritual path. Uh, you feel the immediate consequences of it, uh, 
but also you are generally kind of driven towards the spiritual practice and the spiritual path. Uh, this is what this is about. Uh, so it's kind of surprising how powerful it is, yeah, the simple contemplations like this. Uh, so don't go past it. Uh, don't, uh, don't just take it to as something very simple, because it's not. Uh, it has a, has a powerful effect on you if you use it in the right way. Uh, the other thing that we often do, and I, I've talked about these things before, but I think they're very useless, useful rather to think about. Uh, and that is very often when we are faced with things that we don't like, like, for example, old age, we try to do something about it. Yeah, and what do we do? Well, we, we do use maybe some makeup. Yeah, we use some, uh, we kind of color our hair. Yeah, or maybe use some kind of Botox. I don't know, all of these kind of things. Yeah, but hide the consequences of old age. And what that First of all, what that does, first of all, it is the same thing, which is the denial I was talking about, the denial about the reality was going on. But secondly, it gives you the feeling that you are in charge. It gives you the feeling that you can control these things. Yeah? And of course, that is a false feeling. That is, a, an, again, this idea of the sense of self that kind of sneaks into things and tries to control that which is actually is out of control, uh, tries to make permanent that which actually is impermanent. Uh. And so it gives you a full sense that you are in charge of your destiny. You're in charge of where things are going. So sometimes it is better just to be natural. Yeah? Let the rest of the world use Botox. Yeah? I, don't have to, I don't have to use these kind of things. I, I, the most scary thing I can think of is kind of seeing, one, seeing a monk who uses Botox or maybe a nun who uses Botox. And imagine that happening. Yeah? Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they are. That's kind of where you really have lost the plot about what the Dharma is about. Yeah? But, but the, uh, the idea is that uh, yeah, it, is, is, it is an opportunity for understanding the nature of things. And if we don't take that opportunity, uh, if we first of all deny it, and secondly, we kind of think that we can overcome it through our agency and through kind of sorting things out, uh, then we are actually destroying the opportunity to allow these things to have a spiritual power, a spiritual purpose in our life. And then we're not following it, this uh, um, idea of the Buddha of contemplating these things, yeah, which what this really is about. Uh, so uh, this is uh, an opportunity, yeah, for becoming, for moving the mind onto the spiritual path, uh, making it more peaceful, uh, and that is what this really is about. Uh, so this is the opportunity you, you might actually lose. Uh. So old age can be good, yeah? This is kind of the, the Buddha's kind of message here. Use it in the right way, and it is okay. Yeah? It is like Ajahn Brahm's idea of good, bad, who knows? It is about how you use the realities of life, which makes them good or bad. Things are not good or bad in their own right as such. This is really what, how, this, how this works. Am I making sense to anyone? Or, yeah? I'm, okay, good. I don't know. Sometimes it's kind of... Uh, yeah. Okay, excellent. Uh, so that is the uh, first uh, of these contemplations. Uh, and you can see here what you are doing. This is a kind of perception. Yeah? This is a way of perceiving yourself and perceiving life. Uh, this is a way of thinking about perception. It's actually never called that in the suttas. There is no such thing as the old age perception. Uh, but this is really what it kind of comes down to, what it actually is in the sutta. It is anyway. So you're seeing things uh, more clearly, more uprightly. Yeah. It's kind of a, remarkable sometimes how simple some of these teachings of the Buddha are. Yeah, so straightforward, uh, so easily accessible, because it happens to every one of us. Uh. And uh, remember here what we're talking about here. These are the reflections the Buddha used before he became a monk, right? Uh, so these are the things that made the Buddha to be become a monk. And these are the things that led to his extinguishment, led to Nibbana ultimately. Simple uh, reflections that are kind of there, available to everyone, old age. And then the next one, which is sickness. So let's move on to the next one. Now. It's when someone themselves is liable to fall sick. Uh, this is not very well edited. Anyway understanding the drawbacks uh, in being liable to fall sick, seeking the freedom from sickness, uh, the supreme sanctuary from the yoke, uh, extinguishment. Uh, 
This is very similar to the previous one. Uh, yeah, it is basically about understanding the downside of the body. Uh, yeah, and uh, one of the main points of this is also one of these five contemplations that everyone should do. One of the main points of this again is to understand that the body is far more problematic than we think it is. Uh, and the idea here is that sickness is a fundamental reality of the body. Uh, yeah, you cannot have a body and not be sick. Yeah? And so whenever you get sick, nothing has really gone wrong. Everything has gone right when you get sick. Yeah? And this is the problem, yeah, that everything has gone right. It is actually not a, uh, it is not something that actually can be avoided. Yeah? Uh, and again, very often, there's very similar kind of problems with you have with sickness that you have with the idea of old age, yeah? is that when, first of all, very often you may deny it when you get sick. Oh, no, I don't really want to see it. Don't want to, don't want to be sick again. Yeah? Uh, and the next thing you do is to find some medicines to sort it out. Uh, and of course, you should use medicines, of course. Uh, but again, it can sometimes lead to this kind of illusion that we are in control. Yeah, As long as we have enough doctors and enough sickness, not enough sickness, enough medicines, uh, <laughs> as long as we have these things, we are going to be in charge of our life. We are going to be able to control these things. Uh, but the reality is you cannot control these things. Uh, yeah, eventually, you are going to... Uh, you know, get sick anyway. And uh, even if we find a cure to all the cancers in the world, uh, uh, there's going to be other sick, new sicknesses arising. There's always new things coming, coming about, new problems arising in the world. Uh, and uh, so, um, uh, again, yeah, if you take the opportunity of sickness, when you see your child being sick, uh, you see your husband or wife getting sick, uh, uh, you see people who are very close to get sick, or you see yourself getting sick, uh, Remember, this is not, nothing has gone wrong. Yeah? Yeah, this is actually correct. And uh, again, you take it on board fully and you understand that you're not really in charge, despite the doctors, despite the medicines. Uh, <clears throat> you understand it is an avoidable quality of life. Again, it makes the body less interesting. Yeah? It makes the five sense world less interesting. Yeah? You turn a little bit away, you detach a little bit. Uh, and you will notice that if you do it in the right way, Again, you become more peaceful because that is the nature of detachment. That is the nature of not having so much craving for these things, uh, is that you let it go. And when you let it go, you become peaceful. Uh, this is why the path of meditation is a path of letting go. Yeah? Peace and letting go are two sides of the same coin. Uh, this is what you find through this kind of very, very simple um, contemplations like this. Uh. So... Uh, yeah, so this may sound very depressing. Is it? Is, is, are these teaching depressing? Yeah, is it depressing? Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, good, yeah, this is, a, this, is, this, is, this is good. So what, what that means is that, um, what it means is that uh, it is challenging, right? Uh, and anything that is challenging is often an opportunity for growth. Uh, and if it wasn't challenging, uh, it wouldn't really be interesting. Uh, so it's precisely because it is challenging that in many ways it is interesting. Uh, so uh, uh, the point here is that sometimes you need to face reality to be able to go beyond that reality. If you don't face reality, how can you possibly grow? How can you possibly kind of find the right path out of things? Uh, so you need to face reality first of all, and then there's a chance of kind of getting going beyond it. Uh, this is the whole point of this. Uh, so again, it moves you in the right direction. You find refuge where real refuge is to be found. And you cannot find real refuge in the body. That's really what this is saying, because the body is inherently problematic. Yeah. Let's go on to the next one. Um, so we are... <clears throat> okay, let's have a quick look at the next one. So this is where kind of things really come to a crunch, because this is where all of these things uh, come together. Sickness, old age, and death, yeah? So this is even more, uh, kind of more kind of, uh, <laughs> more depressing. Yeah. Uh, so it is when someone is liable to die, understanding the drawbacks in being liable to die, uh, seeks the freedom from death, uh, the supreme sanctuary from the yoke, extinguishment. Uh. And uh, again, you understand the drawbacks uh, in being liable to die, yeah? Why is death so problematic? And it's not that hard to understand why death is problematic. Yeah. But uh, for you, you can see it when people die. You can see that some people, when they die, they're kind of fighting to live. Yeah? They don't want to die. They find it really hard. Yeah? 
And uh, the reason, of course, why they find it hard is because they have to let go. Yeah. <laughs> Everything in their life has to be given up. And if you are not ready for that, if you don't have anything else to fall back on, nothing else to hold on to, it's going to be very, very difficult for you. And this is kind of the problem with dying. Not only do you have to give up everything in this life, but you're also going on to an uncertain future. What's going to happen after you die? Yeah, this is kind of also a little bit scary, a little bit kind of problematic. Yeah. So everything you have in this life is going to have to go, and you have the prospect of an uncertain future. That's a very difficult combination. Yeah. And so this is why dying is so kind of uncertain. Yeah. And that's why it is so useful to reflect on these things. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, and again, here we are talking about, so you have your own death and you have the death of other people, other things in your life. Uh, all of these things coming together makes it, uh, makes it problematic. Yeah. And so this is why one of the reasons why the death contemplation uh, is such a common contemplation in the suttas. Uh, yeah, the Buddha talks about this in a large number of places, uh, and it kind of becomes one of the, uh, in, compared to old age and sickness, this is far more important to remember the fact that you're going to die. Uh, what does it do when you remember you're going to die? What it does, it basically makes you a better person. And uh, uh, the reason for that is because uh, if you remember that you're going to die, then things in this world become less important to you. Uh, yeah, kind of the things that are in this world, the things that you attach to, the things that you hold on to, the cravings that you have, maybe the ill will or negativity that you have towards people in this world. Uh, all of that is kind of irrelevant, uh, doesn't become important anymore. Uh, if you know that uh, this is maybe the last time you're going to see somebody, uh, how will you uh, treat that person? Uh, yeah, if this is the last time you're going to see the people around you here today, will you treat them well or will you treat them badly? Uh, if you're on your deathbed, are you going to choose to have an argument on your deathbed? Uh, or are you going to choose to kind of say goodbye in a good way? Uh, yeah, you're going to choose to say goodbye in a good way. Uh, <clears throat> and what that shows you is that uh, when you really are dying, uh, it tends to make you peaceful. Uh, it tends to make you at ease. It tends to make you a better person. Why? Because there's nothing in this world to argue about anymore. Uh, there's nothing in this world to be upset about. Uh, yeah? You kind of let go of all the things of this world. And that is kind of the beauty of the idea of dying. Uh, but instead of waiting till you actually die, we take that opportunity to do it now. Uh, yeah. Because if you wait till you die, then maybe it is too late. Maybe you don't have the ability anymore to actually do it at that point. And so the recommendation for death contemplation is always to understand yeah, that if you are going to be ready when you actually are on your deathbed, the only time you can be ready is now. Now is the only time. And if you're not ready now, you're probably not going to be ready when it actually happens to you this is a very important and simple insight. Uh, it means that uh, now is the time yeah, to kind of look after these things. Now is the time to do this. Uh, and then you have the chance to actually do it when the time really comes. Uh, and uh, if you understand that, uh, then you can use the idea of death right now in the present uh, to make you peaceful in your meditation. Uh, because now is the time to be ready. Uh, the Buddha uses some very powerful and very simple ways to explain this, or, or maybe not very, some very kind of basic ideas to explain this. And this is to understand that death is an ever present reality. Yeah, you never know when it might happen. You never know if it's going to happen you know, next week, next month, or whatever. And because you never know, again, now is the time to be ready. Yeah, precisely because you never know. And again, if you're not ready now, then the chances are you will not be ready when it actually happens to you. That's kind of important, yeah? So if you're going to die very soon, what does that mean right now in terms of your attitude to the world, attitude to the people around you? It changes everything, yeah, the moment you can die. If you can die on the way out of this building afterwards, what does that mean? It's difficult to think like that, yeah, because it's so close. But, you know, people in Malaysia, they, they, some of the drive a little bit... Uh, not so, you know, <laughs> carefully. <yeah. laughs> I just came from the airport with Bobby just the other day. It's kind of, you know, people are, you never know what's going to happen, yeah? Accidents happen all the time. One day it's going to be you. Have you, do you, Bobby told me that they were reading in the newspapers about people dying in traffic accidents, so the accidents being happening all the time. So what do you think when you see those accidents in the newspaper? 
Do you think, oh, yeah, that's someone else? Or do you think, oh, that could be me? You, usually, the way people think, when you read about someone dying in a paper, you think, oh, that's someone else. It's got nothing to do with me. You turn the page and you move on, right? That's usually how you think. Yeah, That's the wrong way of thinking. Yeah, Because the right way of thinking is that this happens to people. I am a person. It can happen to me at any time. Sometimes we think, oh, it's just because they were careless, because they didn't drive properly, they didn't look left and right before crossing the street. Sometimes we think that, but that actually is the wrong way of thinking. Yeah? Because very often, it is not that the person is careless, it's that the driver is bad. Yeah? It is that uh, something happens that actually is unavoidable. Yeah? And so when you see these things in the paper, you should always think, that could be me. Yeah? And then you're thinking in the right way. Yeah? And that is kind of very, it changes the ball game completely because it means that the sense of urgency, we're doing the right thing, we're living well. It's now, now is the time to be kind. And when I say now, I don't mean at lunch in a minute. I don't mean, you know, when we walk out of it. I mean this minute, yeah, right now. What is the right thing to do right now? How can I have more compassion in this, this very moment? How can I say the right thing in this moment? Am I saying the right thing? Yeah. It's a good question, yeah. <laughs> when you do so much talking, it's very easy to say the wrong thing. Yeah. Am I saying the right thing? Yeah. And this is kind of the right way of thinking. It brings everything back to the present. Yeah. And this is the power of the death contemplation. Because you know, now is the time to remember these things. Yeah. So remember, again, as I said in the beginning, this is a contemplation the Buddha gave for everyone. Yeah, Whether you are a lay person or a monastic, whether you are a woman or a man, doesn't matter. This is a universal thing for everyone us, for us to remember. Yeah? And if you, I don't know wh whether you like to do death contemplation first thing in the morning when you wake up, uh, is that what you do? <laughs> I know many people who do that, yeah? And they say it's a really good start of the day. Yeah? Because if you start the day with a death contemplation, it means you have the right attitude throughout the day when you go about things. Uh. So for example, first thing in the morning, if you think you're going to die today, and you're leaving your home, you're going to work or whatever, you're leaving your husband and wife, you're leaving your kids, uh, how are you going to leave them if you're going to die today? Uh, or you might die today. You're going to leave them in a good way. Uh, yeah? You're not going to end leave with an argument uh, if you are about to die. Uh, yeah? And this is kind of a beautiful thing. So you bring that into the present, uh, and it means you give everyone a hug, and you say, love you, have a nice, have a wonderful day. Uh, you don't say, yeah, I disagree with that stupid thing you said. Yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean? You don't care about that stupid thing because you're leaving anyway. Yeah? And so this idea of death is a very, very powerful idea. And there is a reason why the Buddha teaches this so many places in the suttas. So it is a reason why almost all great spiritual traditions in the world, they have an idea of death. And they bring that into the spiritual tradition because you understand it affects the way you live. And that is why they're so powerful. So something that at the outset may seem depressive, may seem sad, can be turned into something very beneficial. And your mind then sees the limits of this world around us. The five sense world only lasts for so long. And then you pass away, and then you move on, you don't know where. Yeah? And it makes the whole world seem less interesting. You grow this larger picture of reality, and you see what really matters. And what matters is the quality of your heart right now, the quality of your conduct right now. That is what is important, and that is what will benefit your long-term happiness into the future. Yeah. So um, make these things real. Yeah? When you read in the paper that someone has died, don't other it. Don't say that is about someone else. They were stupid. They did the wrong thing. I would never do that. No, you would do that. That's the whole point. Yeah? Yeah, because we all do stupid things sometimes. Maybe not exactly the same thing, but something similar. Yeah. Oh, they died of cancer. Well, I don't have cancer because you know, I eat well, so I can't have cancer. Yeah, well, that's the wrong view. Huh? Yeah, I had uh, I had a father who died of cancer. He was a very fit man. I had a sister who died of cancer. She was also very fit. Yeah, and they died. And then I thought, where is my cancer? <laughs> because often cancer is like hereditary. Yeah, you get it from your parents. And if I had both a sister and a father. It means I'm probably on very thin ice. Where is the cancer? Probably here somewhere, waiting to come out. What does that mean? Does that, what does that mean right now for me? It means that uh, I have a chance to live well and do the right thing. I better take that opportunity. 
Anyway, so I hope you can see the, the positive side of the negative news. Uh, otherwise, if you can't see the positive, then it's going to be a very sad time for you being here. <laughs> so uh, we only have not had that many minutes left before the, uh, uh, the meal time. Let's do just a short meditation and do some last question and answers before we, uh, before we have lunch together. Yeah. So, uh, could I take some last questions uh, before we break for lunch? So, uh, any, any comments from what we have been doing? Uh, what do you mean by supreme century from the yoga? <laughs> I mean, Anuttara Yoga Kema. <laughs> it's, it's a translation of the Pali, Pali phrase. The Pali phrase is Anuttara Yoga Kema. And uh, Anuttara means like supreme, just so the highest. Uh, and yoga is like. It's like the Indian word yoga, you know, when people go to yoga, they do postures. It's the same word, but the original meaning is not kind of all these postures. The original meaning actually means like exertion, exertion or work. Yeah, that's why yoke here is like work or exertion. It's a yoke in the sense that you are tied to the world and you always have to work and you always have to do things and you always have to strive and you always have to kind of, the world is a place for striving here. And so it's sanctuary from the, all that work. It means that you come to the end of the path and you can relax for the first time. You don't have to work anymore. You don't have to strive anymore. You don't have to look for happiness. You've kind of found the highest peace. And in that sense, it is a supreme sanctuary from work and from yoga. Kema also means like safety. So it is the uh, uh, yoga kema, the kind of the safety from uh, exertion, yeah? or the safety or the liberation from exertion, these kind of things. So it means that you, uh, yeah, you can relax for the first time uh, yeah, in your life. Uh, otherwise, we always run around. We always have to do things. We can never really chill. Uh, we can never really find that peace. Yeah? It's one of the problems of the world. We're driven by craving, slaves to craving. Uh, this is kind of the, um, the issue in life. Uh, this is one of, one of the reasons why meditation, when it works, is such a powerful thing. Because uh, when meditation starts to work, you start to understand what it, how beautiful it is to be peaceful. Uh, and not having to do things. Why craving is such a problem? Why doing, always acting on things in the world is so problematic? Because it is a kind of um, a slavery in a sense. Yeah, You're being driven around, always having to do things, always restless, never really finding peace. And so this is why this is a sanctuary. You know, you know the word sanctuary, right? Uh, yeah, so it's like a sanctuary in that sense. Yeah. Why is it a difficult word? It's the, it's the translator's choice. I don't know. You have to write to the translator and say, translator, please translate differently. <laughs> so I, I, yeah, so I haven't really changed it, but it means like, uh, let's see what Piki Bodhi has as a translation, because he usually has a very nice translation. Let me just bring, bring up his translation and uh, uh, see what he has. Uh, this is the nice thing about having the... Uh, all of these things here. So we can go to, again, this is Sutta Central. Yeah, so this has all the suttas right there. You have the middle length discourses. And then you have the, uh, the sutta we're looking at now is number 26. It's in the chapter of similes. The sixth sutta is called the Noble Search. So there you are. Different translation. Bhikkhu Sujata is the one you just saw. You didn't like that one. Okay, so we'll go to the next one. Bhikkhu Bodhi. <laughs> Let's go to I.B. Horner as well. It's a bit old-fashioned, but let's have a look at different translations. So, so this is um, this is the one. So here you have the, uh, here is called the Supreme Security from Bondage. This is translation. 
Is that better? <laughs> yeah, okay. So you are secure from bondage. Yeah, so that's kind of maybe that's easy. So a yoke is like being bonded. It's a similar kind of idea. Let's see what uh, I.B. Horner has. Uh, this course on the Aryan quest. Okay. Uh, so uh, she has the, the, uttermo the uttermost security from the bonds. That's what she has. It's very similar to what Vicky Bodhi has. Uh. Yeah. So you can see different, um, different kinds of translations. So you choose the one you like. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of nice. No, I don't think so. I think it's just uh, it's just the Bhante Sujata's way of thinking. I think yeah, that's kind of his, that's the way he thinks. So he thinks supreme sanctuary from the yoke. That's what he thinks. Uh. A yoke is what you know what a yoke is. Uh? A yoke is what when you have animals, for example, they kind of you have two oxen. Yeah, they're tied together. That's called a yoke that ties them together. So you are bonded. Yeah, it's the same thing as a bondage. A bondage. Uh, you're held together. So the the freedom the freedom from the uh, the bond. Uh, yeah. So if you want uh, Bhante Siddhartha's email address, I'll give it to you. You can write to him and tell him off and uh, <laughs> see what he says. Uh, yeah. Okay, I think his time is up, uh, Niwen. So uh, there you are. You had the chance to ask questions. You didn't take it, so now his time is up. So uh, okay, so everyone, so let's, let's have a nice lunch. So have a lunch, nice lunch, and we'll see you again at 2 o'clock later on.